This morning we're breaking into John chapter 2, and I'd like to uh, read for you the first uh, 12 verses as we begin. This is the very familiar account of uh, Jesus attending a wedding with his disciples in which the, the, uh, well, the wedding, the, the host runs out of wine. And uh, Jesus very graciously makes wine out of water in order to honor that particular celebration, but also to reveal his glory uh, to his disciples. So let's um, read about it, beginning in verse 1. Uh, John writes this, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Uh, and Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Uh, so in the reading of God's word, may he again bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now again, last time we saw the ministry of John the Baptist. We saw John was doing what he had been called to do, which was point Jesus as the Lamb of God, to point to him as the only sacrifice that God has provided for sin, as the only payment that he will accept for our souls. If you are to be saved, you must trust in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now two of his disciples heard him and they began to follow Jesus. One of them, whose name was Andrew, first found his brother Simon. And he told him that they had found the Messiah. We see Andrew doing what, again, the Lord calls us to do. Going out and finding people we know. And telling them about Jesus. Jesus has come to us. He has revealed himself to us. We know him. And we can share him with others. Now when Simon was brought to Jesus, Jesus saw him and he said that his name would be changed from Simon to Cephas or to Petros, Peter, because of what the Father would later reveal to him at Caesarea Philippi about who Jesus really is. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is the message John wants us to see. And that is the message that we are to proclaim to others. We saw that Jesus then went into Galilee and he found Philip. And he called Philip to follow him, and Philip did. But Philip immediately went out and he found Nathanael and told him that they had found the one Moses and the prophets were pointing to, Jesus of Nazareth. Now at first, Nathanael didn't want to believe because Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem and not from Nazareth. But when he came to Jesus, Jesus changed his mind, which Jesus will do in those he is calling to himself. Jesus, first of all, showed Nathanael that he knew him. Here is an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Here is one who is genuine. Here is one that isn't just putting on an act. Here is somebody who's actually already had his heart changed by the grace of God. And you see, that's what will be true of you and true of me if we really know him. We won't just be acting like Christians. We will be genuine Christians. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Well, he said, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, I think since Nathanael's heart was already the Lord's, this was all the proof he needed. And so Nathanael said, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said to him, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. You will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. 
Now remember, just as the Lord has sent his angels to minister to Jacob when he was on his way to Paddan Aram, so Jesus was saying the Lord would send his angels upon him, uh, upon his son, uh, to minister to him and to minister through him, to bring down, as it were, new revelations and to bring down, as it were, new miracles and signs. In other words, God was going to work through this man, Christ Jesus, who is God in human flesh, but let's not forget he is fully man and had the limitations of man, and so he needed that work, as it were, to empower him to do what it is that he would do. Now this morning, we see the first of these miracles, the first of these signs by which Jesus would reveal who he was, that John would choose to record to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. Now, what I'd like us to do is consider three things from this text this morning. First, the, the setting of the text, that Jesus and his disciples are invited to a wedding and that they honor that wedding by coming. Secondly, the miracle that Jesus performs, he turns water into wine. And then thirdly, the results. He reveals his glory through this and his disciples believe in him which is what these miracles are meant to do for us, to show us the glory of God so that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now first we see Jesus and his disciples present at a wedding celebration. We read in verses 1 and 2. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now, John tells us that this took place on the third day. What exactly he meant by that, we don't know. It could have meant the third day after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Galilee. Or it might have meant it was the third day, uh, it was a three-day journey from where they had previously been. But on this particular day, there was a special event. There was a wedding. And I think we'd have to assume that this wedding was of somebody that Jesus knew, perhaps a relative, perhaps a friend, because his mother was there. And his brothers apparently were there because they were traveling with Jesus, we see in the last verse. And his disciples were also invited to this wedding. Now, one thing that maybe isn't immediately clear is that Jesus' ministry has already begun. This isn't something he did prior to the beginning of his ministry. This is in the course of his ministry. We've already seen that Jesus gathered four of his disciples. And actually, as I've looked through the Gospel of John, I don't see any more collected past those first four, so I think we should assume that he, by this time he had all 12. It's also possible that there were others who were following him by this time because the word disciple, remember, is a broader term than apostle. There were many disciples, but there were only 12 apostles, so it's possible that others were also attending the wedding with him. He may have gathered by this time perhaps a small crowd. Now another thing I think we should note is what this says about marriage. And I just wanted to draw our attention to this because of how marriage has really fallen into disrepute today, as you know, in many different ways. Marriage is an honorable institution. Marriage is a covenant that is ordained by the Lord between one man and one woman for mutual care and love and support of one another. And we see that our Lord honored this event by his attendance. I mean, our Lord Jesus Christ obviously was not anti-sociable. He didn't stay away from events like this, but he honored them because these were things instituted by his Father. Now again, I said that because it's becoming increasingly rare today to see a man and a woman get married. I mean, oftentimes they live together or you know, marriage doesn't even seem to come into the picture. It's kind of like a last step if you're sure you want to cement this relationship together. It's becoming increasingly rare to see a man and a woman keep themselves sexually pure before they get married. And if a man and a woman get married, it's becoming increasingly rare to see them actually remain faithful to one another. But you see, this is God's will, and we need to remember that. Society does not dictate to us what we should do. God is the one who tells us. And he tells us that marriage is between a man and a woman. And it is, he tells us what it is and what it is that we must wait for until we get married. And he tells us it is for life. By the way, we're going to deal with marriage this evening. And we'll have, um, be able to plunge a little more deeply into it 
then. But this is what marriage is, and this is how we will see it. This is how we will honor it. This is how we will uh, hold it up as the Lord will have us to, if we know him, if we love him. We will honor God in our marriages, and if we're not married, we will, we will wait for what the Lord has told us we must wait for until we get married. We will live sexually pure lives. That's what those who love the Lord want to do, because that's what God wants. And so first of all, we see Jesus present at a wedding, a wedding celebration in order to honor that event. But next we see the miracle, of course, that John wants to point out to us. The one he selects to record by which Jesus reveals his glory. And it's really quite an unusual miracle. And if all the different things Jesus did, this seems like an interesting one for him to pick. He turns the water into wine. Now in verse 3 we read this. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now John tells us basically a minor crisis rose at this celebration. Apparently those who planned it didn't count on maybe so many people attending or that the people would be as thirsty as they were. Uh, they likely had the same problem that we have today, you know, when you're having some kind of celebration. Those of you who have planned weddings, you know, you invite so many people, you try to figure out how many people are going to be there, you ask for an RSVP, and most people usually don't. And you really don't know how many people are going to show up at that event. Apparently, they misplanned uh, what they expected to see. But being concerned about how this was going to affect the celebration, and obviously knowing by this time what Jesus was capable of doing, Mary comes to Jesus to see if he might do something about it. I mean, she knew he must be able to, otherwise she wouldn't have asked. And what she said, I think we need to understand here, was not to inform Jesus uh, of something in the hopes that, you know, perhaps um, he would do something about it. I think she was asking him to do something. They have no wine. And clearly this is how Jesus understood what she said to him because of his response. He says in verse 4, Woman, what does that have to do with us? Sometimes we read that and we say, well, that seemed kind of rude on the part of Jesus to say that. Why are you talking to me about the wine? That has really nothing to do with me. And I think other translations, Jesus says something like this, uh, Woman, what do I have to do with you? You know, it's kind of like, leave me out of this or take care of it yourself. But that's not what he was saying. What Jesus is actually saying is this, you're not the host, and I'm not the head waiter, and this really isn't our responsibility. You see, it's not your responsibility, Mary, it's not my responsibility. And he further reminds her of this in verse 4. My hour has not yet come. Now, this, I think, tells us the main reason behind what Jesus was saying and why it seems like he was being a bit reluctant to do anything about the situation, and that's because the time had not yet come when he would clearly reveal to the world, or at least to his people Israel, who he was. That is, God's Messiah. Because in so doing, we know, it was going to turn up the world's hatred against him and would hasten, as it were, his rejection and his crucifixion. His hour had not yet come. His brothers would later challenge him to reveal himself at the Feast of Booths in John chapter 7, but he will say this in verse 6, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. What time is he referring to? The time where he would reveal himself clearly as the Messiah. He will later say this when he teaches in the treasury of the temple that he wasn't arrested yet, or John will point this out, because it wasn't yet his time in chapter 8, verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. But as we well know, that time would come when he would clearly reveal who it was that he was and he would lay down his life. He says in John chapter 12, verses 23 through 24, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
Let me just remind you, Jesus was telling them here, it was necessary for him to die, otherwise you and I could not have life. But if he were to die and raise again from the dead, we could also live, can be raised from the dead. We can have life. But I want you to notice again, getting back to our text, even though it was not the hour yet for Jesus to reveal himself, he was still willing to honor the celebration in, in a very guarded way by, by helping. In verse 5, we read, His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now again, notice, I don't think Mary was trying to force Jesus' hand, compelling him to do something when he really didn't want to do something. I think she understood he was willing to help. And so she calls the servants together and says, Listen to Jesus, he's going to tell you now what it is you are to do. Well, Jesus is going to take care of the problem. They ran out of wine, so he's going to make some more wine. But where is he going to put the wine? In verse 6 we read this. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And by that he didn't mean, well, okay, here were vessels that happened to be in the house that were set there that were being purified because something unclean had happened to them. But these were basically the water pots that were provided by the host for the ceremonial washing of the hands and feet as the people were gathering together uh, to celebrate the wedding. You know, when you come in off the street, as you see in the Last Supper, Jesus girds himself with a towel, he washes the disciples' feet. This is what that water was for, for the people to ceremonially purify themselves as they come into the wedding. Now apparently these vessels, these uh, pots, water pots, were almost empty because those who had invited or were invited had already used the water that they contained. I mean, all the guests were there. They had already gone through the ceremonial purification. And so Jesus, in verses 7 through 10, says this to the servants, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Uh, he was surprised by the quality of, of this wine. Now, notice, water went into the pots, but wine came out. And not just any wine, but the best wine. Now, was this some kind of trick that Jesus was performing here? Were these like trick water pots where you put water in and wine comes out? Well, we don't read anywhere in the text that the people were upset because they had to wash themselves in wine when they came into the wedding feast. There was water in them before. Uh, was this a trick that the disciples decided to do to try to help Jesus along, somehow miraculously producing wine by going out and purchasing 120 to 180 gallons of wine and filling them up while the servants watched? Well, really, they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that even if they wanted to because they poured water in to these empty pots and they immediately drew wine out. Jesus performed a miracle. Jesus did something that only God could do. He transformed the substance of that water into wine. Now, let me, let me draw your attention to two things at this point, and we're going to get to the main thrust of this in the last point, but I couldn't resist dealing with, with this particular side issue. I want you to notice that Jesus made wine, okay? Some of us here undoubtedly were raised in homes where you were taught that alcohol was evil, or perhaps in churches where you were taught that same thing. I mean, that was my particular upbringing. Wine is evil, alcohol is evil, have nothing to do with it. If you touch it, you're in sin and so forth. And I remember hearing a very popular evangelist preach this very thing on television saying that, you know, really rebuking those people who would ever accuse Jesus Christ of ever having that wicked liquid on his lips. Okay, it just couldn't be. Jesus is holy. And certainly if wine were sin, Jesus never would have drunk it himself. But I do want you to notice here that Jesus made wine. 
Now, the word that's used here in, in the Greek is, means this, a fermented beverage made from the juice of grapes. Now, I want you to realize there's a lot of debate over the alcoholic content of what it is that Jesus made and the kind of wine that, that the Jews drank in those days, but I, I want you to recognize that this is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in Ephesians 5.18, where he says this, and do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Whatever the alcoholic content was of that wine that's being referred to, it could make you drunk if you drank too much. But far from condemning its use, the Lord not only made wine on this occasion, He actually made good wine. He made the best wine. He also, by the way, used wine to institute the Lord's Supper. And if wine were sin, He could not have done that. It's not a sin to drink wine. Jesus made wine. Jesus drank wine. Remember how Jesus said on one occasion, uh, you know, the son of, well, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and he didn't mean by that that John didn't drink a drop of any liquid his entire life. It meant he wasn't drinking wine. And you say he has a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking, and you say, well, basically, here's a wine bibber, here's a drunk, and a glutton. There's no way to please you guys. But I want you to notice Jesus said that he drank wine. That was the common beverage of the Jews in that day. There was nothing wrong with drinking wine. But I do want you to notice something else, and we see that here at this wedding feast. Even though it isn't a sin to drink wine or alcoholic beverages, it is a sin to get drunk. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. What happens when you drink too much wine or too much alcohol? It takes over, doesn't it? It gains control of you. It makes you act differently, behave differently than you otherwise would. Basically, that's what it means to be filled with something. It means to be under its control. You are not to be under the control of wine. You are not to be under the control of anything, Paul says, but the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit. If you are to live the kind of life that God calls you to live, you have to be controlled by the Spirit. If you're not, all you're going to do is sin. And of course, Jesus is the only one who can give you that Spirit. You need to come to Him. Now, the Jews knew that it was a sin to be drunk. They knew it was God's will that they shouldn't uh, be under its influence and control, which is why no one at this wedding was drunk. Now, you know, the head waiter was not talking about drunkenness when he said what he did in verse 10. Every man serves the good wine first, but when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. He wasn't saying that you begin serving lesser quality wine when the people are too drunk to know the difference. That's not what was going on here. What he means by this is you won't be able to distinguish between good wine and bad wine if you've drunk enough of it to basically take that sharpness out of your taste buds. Let me give you an example. You know how it is when you eat something that you really enjoy and how good that first bite is? <laughs> but you realize how it's downhill after that? The first bite is so good, but the next bite isn't quite as good, and the next bite until after a while you're eating it doesn't seem special at all. Well, that's what happens here. And I think it's also the case when you go out to tasting different wines. In order to clear one wine out of your palate, you've got to rinse your mouth with something so that your taste buds will be ready for the next taste, as it were, the next sip. What, what the, the head waiter was saying was, you know, you serve the good wine, and then when they can't distinguish it anymore, not because they're drunk, but because their taste buds can, then you serve a lesser quality wine, and it's, it's not so much of a big deal. Well, Jesus provides good wine and apparently the head waiter hadn't drunk so much that he couldn't tell the difference. He knew that they had saved the best wine until last. Now Jesus obviously, secondly, would never have provided more wine if he knew everybody was already drunk. No, Jesus provided it to honor that occasion and because the people were drinking responsibly and because he wanted to, again, honor what was going on. It's not a sin to drink, but it is a sin to get drunk. Jesus made wine, and he made the best wine. 
All right, well now let's get to the final point, which is the main point behind what John writes here. We see the result of the miracle. What was Jesus really aiming at, at least in the small circle in which he did this miracle? He was revealing his glory. And it had the result that it should have. His disciples believed in him. John writes in John 1, or excuse me, I guess this is um, chapter 2, verse 11. I put the wrong reference here. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This was the reason Jesus did this. Jesus turned the water into wine as a sign, as a miracle, to show who he was. I would draw your attention again to what it is that John wrote at the end of his gospel, which is what we looked at at the very beginning of this book as we sort of broke open its purpose. He gives us a purpose statement in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why was this particular event recorded by John? It was recorded so that you might believe that he is who he said he is. And that believing in him, you might actually have life. Because who is it that can turn water into wine? Only God can do this. And God, in fact, did this. Now again, we need to understand how how Jesus is, is, is ministering, as it were, in his ministry. Jesus, the word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. He became fully man. He didn't come invested with divine power, with divine knowledge, as it were, and omnipresence and omniscience and omnipotence. He had to, as it were, well, live as a man lived. And when these miracles were done, they were done perhaps in in a different way than we might think they were done. They were done through the power of the Holy Spirit. We've already seen angels would be ascending and descending, and these works would be, be being done through him as God also worked in the past through other men. I mean, for instance, um, Elijah, remember he was sent to the poor widow in Zarephath. And she was to provide for him. All she had was a a bull with a little bit of flour in it and a, a jar with a little bit of oil. And she was ready to make a little cake of bread for herself and her son. They were going to eat it and die because of the famine and it was going on there. But Elijah comes to her and he says, the Lord says that this bowl of flour is not going to run out or this jar of wine until this this famine is over. And the Lord kept producing more flour and more oil. We have another example of the same thing when Elisha comes to a poor widow to save her two sons from being sold into slavery. There's a jar of oil that is continually produces oil filling a bottle and as it were vessel after vessel until she is able to pay off her debts so her children don't have to go in slavery. God does do these kinds of miracles through other men. So the fact that Jesus did this himself doesn't prove that he he was who he was, but we also need to recognize God never allows any man to do a miracle to, uh, as it were, support a lie, but only to support the truth. If Jesus was being deceptive about who he was, God would have never, of course, Uh, as it were, uh, verified who he was through these miracles. Now, what had Jesus actually claimed about himself up to this point? Well, really, he hadn't said anything too specific because his hour had not yet come. It isn't until we get to chapter 12 and 13 where Jesus begins to speak more plainly to his disciples, you know, no longer in this kind of language that they weren't quite sure exactly what he meant. He's going to reveal that a little bit later, but there were some things that had been revealed. He did tell Nathanael, after all, that he would see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. John the Baptist said of him, this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God. And Jesus certainly didn't deny that. And then when Nathanael said to him, you are the Son of God, you were the King of Israel. Jesus, far from denying what Nathanael said, actually confirmed it. He says in John 1, verse 50, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? 
you will see greater things than these. You believe that I am the Son of God and the King of Israel? Jesus didn't deny it. He was confirming it. That's who he was. Now, in, in this miracle of changing the water into wine, Jesus was simply revealing more of who he was. He was showing us something. I want you to notice of his glory. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky as far as trying to understand how these things work together. But Jesus, in his divine nature, was working through his human nature to do these miracles, and he was revealing the glory of who he actually was. Again, we, that's the reason why Jesus came into the world. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was revealing his glory through this miracle. And we should note it had the effect that it was meant to have on those who were privileged enough to see it. Um, again, in uh, John chapter 2, verse 11, this beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested or revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now I think it's also possible that maybe some of the servants who saw this believed because they too saw the miracle. But not everybody saw it. Okay? It was just to a small circle because his hour hadn't yet come but he revealed his glory. His disciples saw it and they believed. To those who have faith, we saw this once before, to those who have, to those who have faith, more shall be given, that is, more evidence will be given to them of this truth, but to those who don't have faith, even what they have will be taken away from them. They will not be given greater evidence because what do we see the Jewish leaders do with everything they saw Jesus doing? They saw him doing miracles and instead of believing on him, they saw those miracles and said, this man has to die. He has to get out of here. Otherwise, the Romans are going to come and take away our place. It just shows the wickedness of their hearts. You see, to those who have faith, Jesus reveals even more of himself, more of his glory. But to those who don't have it, he takes away even what they may have seen. Now, con to conclude this section, we see that Jesus went down to Capernaum now, what we read in Matthew 4 says he stayed there for a few days, but this is basically going to be his base of operations for a while. This is where he's going to make his home. And he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and, and they stayed there, again, as I've said, a few days. Now, let me just close with an application. What the Spirit of God intends by putting this text here, what John intended uh, by actually recording this particular event. Jesus did this miracle to show who he was and who he is. He is the Son of God. The power by which he did this miracle was really, as I mentioned before, his, his own. It wasn't power possessed by his humanity, but it was power possessed in his deity. The one who said, as John says, in the beginning was the word, the words with God, all things came into being by him. The one who said at the beginning, let it be. And the heavens and the earth leapt into existence by the power of his word, commanded that this water become wine. And it obeyed him. Now it may seem like a small thing, but try it. See if you can do it. You can't because only God can. Now, in doing this miracle, Jesus revealed his glory, the glory which he had as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of truth. Now, again, as Jesus goes about revealing his glory, there's going to be two responses to this. There are going to be those who see it and who marvel at it and who believe and embrace Jesus Christ. But there's also going to be those who see it and who hate him and want to do away with him. Now, who is it that makes the difference? It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God opens the eyes of one. The Spirit of God doesn't open the eyes of other. And he's not bound to open the eyes of anyone. When he does it, it's purely gracious because of God's choice. 
and because the Father intends to give them to His Son. Now the question I would ask you this morning is this, has the Spirit of God opened your eyes to see His glory? Now if He has, then you, when you read things like this and when you read the Scriptures, they aren't just a dead letter to you. They're not just words on a page, but they come alive. They come alive with, with a visible, as it were, glory, although not something that, that shines with, with light on the page, but something which shines with light in your minds, something that is seen that is beautiful, something that is glorious, something that you, that you want, something you desire. That's what the Spirit of God does. And that work of illumination of the Holy Spirit in revealing this glory also convinces you that these words are true, that Jesus actually did perform this miracle. He actually is God in human flesh. He is the one that you must believe in in order to be saved. Now, if you see what it is that John is revealing this morning, if you see this glory, does it have the effect on you that it had on the disciples? Does it strengthen your conviction that he is, in fact, the Christ? He is the Son of God. Does it strengthen your faith? Does it strengthen your resolve to trust in him alone and to give yourself to him unreservedly, to follow him wherever he may lead you? Well, again, if the Spirit of God is at work in your hearts, that's exactly the effect that it will have on you. And to the degree the Spirit of God is at work in your hearts, to that degree you will desire these things. Jesus revealed his glory. The disciples saw it and they believed on him. But you see, I mentioned there are two different groups, aren't there? There are those who see that glory and there are those who don't. And those who don't see that glory are going to read this and it's not going to affect them at all because they are just dead letters on a page. Things perhaps to be understood, but not things to be desired, not things to be loved, not things to be seen as real. If that's the case with any of you this morning, if you don't see God's glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, you do need to realize you're never going to trust Him the way you need to trust Him. You're never going to embrace Him as your Lord and your Savior. You're never going to have a regard for Him in the way that you need to when you're making the choices you make every single day of your life because you don't love Him and you don't care. You don't care what He thinks. You don't care about anything but what you want and what you want to do. This is how seeing the glory of God changes you. It changes the whole course of your life. It makes you, instead of going the direction the world is going, you go the direction that Jesus wants you to go. It's the Spirit of God that reveals that glory and that causes that change. So as long as you are blind to that glory, you are lost and on your way to judgment. If you don't see that glory this morning, you need to pray that God would give you His Holy Spirit that the Spirit of God would open your eyes and change your heart so that you would come to Jesus, truly come to Him in your heart and trust Him, place your whole hope of heaven on Him and of course turn away from your sins so that trusting in Jesus Christ and believing on Him, you might actually have eternal life, which is not just a duration of life, but it is a quality of life that you would have that divine nature, you would have the Spirit of God living in you, acting through you, making you more like Jesus Christ so that you will do as we saw Jesus did at the beginning in Matthew chapter 4. When you're tempted by the devil, you don't just fall in with him and say, sure, I'll take you up on that. But you say, that isn't God's will for my life. God's will is this. This is what is written and that is what I will do. May God give us grace to see that glory and to be drawn out to Christ, to trust in Him, to turn from our sins, that we may have eternal life and that we may follow Jesus Christ. That's essential if we're going to come to the table. We can't just be living any way we want to live. We just can't be living our own lives. We need to be living as the Lord calls us to live. If the life of Christ is in you, this table is for you. But if that life isn't in you, it isn't. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, begin to prepare us to come to the table. But 
let's judge ourselves particularly on this. Have we seen the glory of God? Do we really love Jesus Christ? Are we really following him? Or are we still blind? And have yet, you know, the need for our eyes to be open. And then let's ask the Lord accordingly uh, to grant to us what it is we need. So let's spend a few moments in prayer.